We desire to address the issue of high unemployment and low productivity in Brazil by offering innovative approaches that provide employed and underemployed people with the necessary skills to work 21st century and high paying jobs. For this, dis for this discussion, we will have Kiwi Yang and Cherry Kutu moderated by Daniel Castelo. Now, I will give you guys a brief bio of each one of them. Kiri Yang is the founder and CEO of LifeGuard, an education technology company that equips the next generation with interpersonal skills to drive and lead in an exponentially changing world. Kiri bootstrapped her first, first company at the age of 16, reaching 3 million in profit by the time she graduated from UCLA at age 19. She built, scaled, and sold four companies, including the latest one that was taken to over a 1 billion valuation. Sherry Kutu is a senior entrepreneur and angel investor who serves on the board of companies, charities, and universities. She chairs Founders for Schools, Work Finder, and a scale up institutes, and also serves as an executive member of the Royal Society, Cambridge University, Raspberry Pi, and the London Stock Exchange. She has invested in more than 60 companies as an angel and five venture capital firms. Daniel Castanho is chairman of the board and one of the founders of Learning Educação. He comes from a family with the DNA connected to education, inter connected to education. Entrepreneurship enthusiast, he was the founder of the business virtual case incubator, Subway's partner in Sorocaba, and also a partner of the Fight and restaurant in Sao Paulo. In 2018, he was nominated by the Association of Brazilian Higher Education Maintainers to the Newton Santos Prize of Superior Education in the category Business Manager and was the winner in the category Remarkable in 2018 in its third edition of the Remarkable Gallery. Please join me in welcoming Sherry Kutu, Kiri Yang, and Daniel Castel. And we need 
to change this mindset. We need to, to, to prepare these students to be entrepreneurs, to have an open mind, to, to have a different way to, to, I mean, to see the world. And, uh, and, uh, and the other thing that just to add, with the social media, what happens with the social media, with the algorithms? They are building the walls and creating more tribes. And we need to develop the empathy for these students. Then the attitude, the entrepreneur attitude. When I said entrepreneur, it's not the owner. The owner is the guy that takes a risk. The entrepreneur will work with a purpose. And we need to do it. We need to create purpose and in the same time to develop the empathy to, to create a team and all these guys work in a team. And then I'd like to start curing uh, how, can, how can, can we encourage the population to find purpose and look for a job that is a fulfilled that purpose. I think this is a great question. So how, how can we, as business leaders, encourage young people to find purpose? It's something that we talk about every day at work. Because the way that traditional society has prepared students is that they encourage fish to go climb trees. As parents, as an Asian American, we're always told, be a lawyer, engineer, or doctor or something, right? That makes most money and stability. But time has changed. These young people want more, demand more, and they want to change the world. They are living a, a, a life that has more purpose, but also they have to navigate so much resource and this abundance of going from scarcity mindset to navigating this world of so much resources that they can find, and whether or not they can just hop on a plane with very cheap lights and go and be an Instagram influencer, all the way to, you know, everything that you need is in the tip of your hand in Google. Um, you can be the expert of anything you want. So how do they go about finding that purpose? It's actually not from the traditional education system. It's actually from the companies where they go in and they really need that safe ground where they can experiment and find out that they themselves are either monkeys needing to climb the trees or fish that they need to go to the ocean, but it's really up to them to decide and give them the choice. So we as a company, what we learned is that it's the companies out there that's providing, that are receivers of the students as a future labor force to give that platform and to give that opportunity. So I think how we can encourage that is really giving them that, that safe place and acknowledging that they're not prepared for work and it's okay that it's okay to fail in a safe environment and not to say that it's a failure but more so experiment, encouraging them to be on this journey. And uh, what do you think about Brazil? Maybe the productivity, I mean, just putting corruption aside. But productivity is the, the, word, the worst problem that we have. It's the biggest problem that we have. And uh, if, if we just start to grow again, maybe in a few years or a month, I don't know, we will have a burnout. If, because you have a, a employment at the same time that you have a open jobs with a, 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 a lack of qualification. Then, uh, as, I, as I told you, the employment rates today for individuals aged between 18 and 20, 24 is around 25 percent. It's uh, more than double the, the, the overall employment rate. Both of you work in a project that addresses the problem of youth employability. And then, Sherry, what do you believe that is the key factors leading to youth employment? And what do you see that effective solutions for, for this problem? Thank you. Uh, well, I think I already build on what, um, what Kiri was saying. 
Um, the solution lies in the people who are creating the jobs. And um, we know that 100% of the net new jobs come from companies that didn't exist five, five, six, seven years ago. So if the current solution is exposing young people to professions or careers that nobody's going to work in in the future, then that's not going to help your productivity. And it will help prepare the young people for, for work. We um, produced some research um, last week on age-appropriate um, student employer encounters, which showed that as early as two or three years old was important to help expose them to employers who were creating tomorrow's jobs so that they understood how to navigate it. I know um, with my LinkedIn advisory board hat on, one of the you know, myths is that you make a really big decision and then you have to stick with that decision. But we know that uh, from analyzing the data behind people's current CVs, or not CVs, LinkedIn profiles, that the average number of jobs held is 25 between graduating from you know, sec secondary school and retiring, and that's now. Um, the average number of jobs that millennials will have held by the time they're 30 is 10. Um, so navigating is, is really important. So I think instilling in them a, an understanding that they will navigate and that uh, it's navigational skills that they need to pick up in the school so that they understand, right, well, I've got communication and that I'm interested in physics. Um, what are the pathways that can lead us towards? And because there's such a myriad of pathways and they're changing quickly, so that the advice of you should be a lawyer or a doctor or something else is invalid advice. What we see is um, teachers literally having nervous breakdowns because they feel the pressure to advise people on what they should do in the future, but they really don't know. So in the UK, we created um, a platform um, to help teachers um, access the jobs of the future and allow them, regardless of the age of their, their, their uh, children that they're stewarding, um, allow them to get those employers who are assets in their community into their classrooms so that the young people could have sufficient number of encounters at a very young age so that they could imagine for themselves and be empowered for themselves from that. Um, and from the age of 16 to 24, which is the thing that's nicely with your platform, um, creating a, an app sort of over, over the mobile phone, and I think there's probably a video on, on what we've created, that allows them to explore by interconnecting with other platforms. So there's deep interconnections between our platform and LinkedIn and government databases on how fast the companies are growing. So that if they've chosen a, let's say, a big shrinking company where everybody is miserable, um, for their first 20 hours of work experience, this is pretty permanent jobs, then we will recommend them something fast and interesting, like maybe Curious Company or some of the other companies here or in whatever neighbor, neighborhood. The beautiful thing is that there are databases that allow us to know where the fast growing companies are. Um, and it's our responsibility to advise people to taste, um, to have tasters with those companies. Little tasters, not big long ones. Um, but if you think about the average young person is saying a year per placement, that decreases the incentive of the employer to invest heavily in them. So if you can give them a number of experiences from a younger age, that means that they can be more confident by the time they take that permanent position, then that changes, uh, well, changes the economic of the, uh, of the system and increases productivity. Teachers aren't experts in the jobs of the future, so they absolutely need a platform that they can depend on. Um, and you absolutely need AI and machine learning to give them proper, well-informed um, information and decisions, because nobody can actually keep on top of everything in every community unless you use data and platforms. So we create, as an entrepreneur, I created platforms to enable both teachers of children from as young as two years old um, up to 18, who don't actually do the university market, um, and then from 16, uh, enabling young people to explore those really cool, sexy companies. Um, and even the unsexy companies, but you know, if you're going to have 100 hours of experience, let's have 40 hours of unsexy experience, uh, and 60, you know, even having a violent negative reaction to an 
experiment of work is, is an outcome, is an outcome which is important for young people, so you know what you don't want. And I think often it's narrowing down the things you don't want to do that makes you more certain about what you do want to do and best get that experimentation out of the way. I just wanted to pick up one thing you mentioned, um, learning from mistakes. Um, I don't actually think they're mistakes. I think all learning is good and they're hypotheses that we're testing out. Um, and I hate the word failure, and maybe that's because I'm a scientist. We are experimenting and testing hypotheses. And if you try something out as a morsel and you don't like it, that's okay. But if you make a big, you know, big investment and you don't like it, then that's damaging for you. It's probably damaging for the employer, and it's probably damaging for society as well. So it's not failure, it's testing hypotheses. Do you have a video to I do have a, a video that shows the platform for students um, which we can, we, I'm happy to show, because you, you saw it yesterday and went, oh, that's yes. so much better than what you said. Yes. So um, it's probably better than what I said. So we can look at that as a, as a, as a something. I, I, I absolutely agree with everything Sherry was saying, so I just wanted to comment on yeah, that. Yeah, because yesterday, yesterday she showed me this one, and I said, oh, I have to show. And then you try to do something with the iPhone here, but then you have a video, yes? I think make the video work some magic person in this technical school. Meanwhile, I'd love to comment on um, the ret retention rate, basically. Uh, students not feeling like they have the right purpose of. Yeah. Can we have the sound? I think that's the end of it. I'm not going to start at the start. Yeah, so have sound. Useful. I can talk through it. <laughs> I can do a voiceover if we don't have sound. I'll beatbox next to you. <laughs> Yesterday, when we had lunch, she told me. Okay, I'll do a voiceover. So you pick it up, you say what part of the country you're in, or you let it know where you are. Um, it shows up the fast growing companies there. You tell it which companies you want to work for, so computing and think here. Uh, it narrows it down. Um, you pick one. Um, and again, that is drawn from LinkedIn and from the company, the accounting, the things that they file. You favorite it so you can share it with your friends or your parents, or your parents use it and they highlight it for you. You apply. Um, actually, you have to tell us some information before you apply. You get notifications over the platform um, provide a variety, a variety of things, uh, which will tell you about the applications that you've made. Um, and there, I think you're there. So that was me attempting a, voice, a voiceover of what was otherwise a very professional video. Um, But the, all of that's an interconnection of a whole bunch of different platforms and data, and the recommendations, which are really, really important, are again um, acting on algorithms of what's really important for the employers as opposed to what we might otherwise think. Do you? And uh, talking about engagement and also retention of these young employees, I think it's really a fascinating conversation because. When my co-founder and I came together to decide on our first customers, we wanted to, we were actually saying no to a lot of other Fortune 500, in fact, Fortune 50 um, companies because we wanted to really showcase and role model these cutting edge tech startups that every young people wanted to work for. And that um, our first mentorship mentee matching program actually was suggested and Airbnb came to us and said, hey, we know that you guys are the experts in this field. Please, um, can you come in and help us create a platform that's going to help foster this kind of um, personal development and professional development growth place for young people? And since then, it's been, it's been just such an amazing experience going in and learning about how these leaders are thinking because they're, they're tripling, I mean, they're doubling and tripling their employees. Um, Airbnb is going, they're hiring over 2,000 people just in the next few years. And all these pre-IPO companies, as many of you guys already know, 
um, Silicon Valley is having IPO um, party coming up soon, um, happening right now, and we have customers like Salesforce, Shopify, Airbnb, and um, just recently GitHub and WeWork, who are really, really understanding what the young people want. And according to a Gallup poll, over 70% of Americans are disengaged with work, which means that's hundred millions of dollars productivity money that's being lost. And how they can go about it is really understanding and listening to what these young people are looking for. And the first thing that these young people say or the young employees talk about why they leave or stay at work is professional development and career development as well as, as, long as, um, as, well as personal development. That's the number one thing that they're looking for in a job. But a lot of these Fortune 500 companies are failing to listen to that because they feel that if we invest in these young people on uh, over 10, 10 jobs in their 20s, like they're gonna go somewhere else. Why should I do my um, competitors a favor? But what they're failing to see is they're also the receivers of, of they're just, it's an ecosystem. And what Silicon Valley has really figured out is that we're going to, the more we invest in people, they're going to come back. It's like a boomerang society. So everyone is jumping on that bandwagon. And we have started this um, conference bringing all the learning and development specialists to invest and understand and see what's going on. So we have a conference called Technocon that happens um, every October. Um, this one coming up at Twitter is bringing all the leaders of these um, tech companies to share what, what initiatives are working for, for their employees, how they're increasing the retention rate, and how they're allowing and reskilling and upskilling their, their young people in this exponentially changing society. And it's been extremely productive. And so I'm really honored to be here to share this with, um, with everyone here because it's, it's working here. Um, and I just wanted to comment on the learning and development. That was showing you the, the student journey. What we haven't shown you is the host journey. And the hosts do work, uh, the 20 and 30 year olds who work at Twitter. And this is a way of them to develop their own professional development. So our customers are the startups and scale-ups because it's important for them to, to, um, to give these learning opportunities of supervising younger people <coughs> on meaningful projects that, uh, again, unlocks a program for them. Um, and again, we were, you know, wasn't really sure how it was going to work. And you think the young people would think, well, actually, the demand is coming from the fast-growing companies, and they see this as a way of retaining their young, their young people and getting them leadership and development opportunities from a, from a young age, and tracking it as well. Because what they're hoping is that, you know, every year we want you to oversee and to host 100 hours of work experience each year. And that's an important part of your own development here, is giving back to the next generation. Some regard it, some call it, and I don't really like it in the scientific community, as a, as a sort of a rite of passage, or almost the new national shirt, that the new national service is giving back to the young people of the earlier generation while you're still at work. And I, I think that's quite good. You know, you know, we can't complain about how hard it is to hire people if we don't give back to the next generation and help them understand what meaningful work is and why we love what we do. And what, what I love about that is um, people think that all the best talents are here in Silicon Valley. So my co-founder, um, Marco, has, uh, he's the founder of Maracana that got acquired by Twitter University, and he started Twitter University there. He's also one of the founders of Girls Who Codes and ran the biggest um, meetup for engineers here in Silicon Valley. And what's really fascinating is our entire dev shop of the developers are from Brazil. It tells you a lot. He was like, as, as he, we were actually uh, discussing on, on Sunday to um, uh, just talk about what we're gonna discuss here, he was really adamant, please let all the business leaders that will be attending this conference, what an amazing, incredible talent you guys have in your own homeland in Silicon Valley, uh, sorry, in, in Brazil, that Silicon Valley is like going out of the way to make sure that they accommodate the time differences um, to, to work with them because the learning agility and the passion that they have is incredible. Um, and so that, that um, divide that we have in our minds is completely dismantled.
dismantled here because what we focus here in Silicon Valley is that passion, that um, adaptability, as well as the purpose-driven learning agility, where people are constantly wanting to learn and dying to learn, and more than half of our developers are women. And they are so in tune with the understanding and listening to the customer's needs that their, their ability to innovate is incredible. And so our platform is extremely user-friendly, and it's, it really shows from our developers how much they really care about serving the clients. Um, I would start with the inspiration behind starting up this series of apps was a girl called Maitri who um, had had a terrible work experience. And she said, oh, I'm really loving this. This is really a cool company. I'm loving what I'm doing here. Um, and she said, and I really wish I could tell everybody not to go to the last place I had work experience at. And I was going to make this quick visit, like, well, we, there should be an app for that. And so we basically had a hackathon, and that was the initial prototype, was allowing her to share with her friends what she thought of this you know, employer who hadn't really given her an opportunity, and also what, uh, you know, what we needed to do in order to make it meaningful for the young person and to give them the means to navigate their own future. What do you think, uh, uh, what is the way to, 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 because we have the life guide that is a kind of mentorship that you said, and uh, we need to develop the soft skills and then technical skills. How do to, to, you said, you know, it's the, 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 the first uh, thing that I have to do in the, in the workplace is to, 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 to learn to develop all the main employees. And how to, to provide, what's the best way to provide this both uh, learning, I mean, soft skills, and how to measure soft skills? Because it's difficult to measure soft skills. Yes, it's technical skills, it's, it's okay. And, uh, and after that, I'd like to know how to match uh, uh, employers and, and employees or jobs and, 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 and uh, people that are looking for a job uh, and how to, to, to analyze the soft skills also. Same, how to develop and, uh, and then how to analyze and to match the needs of soft skills. Uh, this is a really great question. Um, I think what's really fascinating for us as we go in and learn the, these initiatives and what we provide to companies and measuring success of our platform is that um, so much of the money is being spent on recruiting. I mean, you spend over $40,000, $50,000 on, on employee, per employee recruiting for engineers to all these tech talents, but you lose them so quickly, they barely stay more than a year and a half of average. So one of the things that most of these um, cutting edge pre-IPO billion dollar unicorns have figured out is that why look far out when you know, they understand that the grass is always greener on the other side, right? Um, within the company, there are so many incredible um, mentors who are senior executives, managers who seize the talent, and it's really a matter of crowdsourcing that within the company. So what we provide, we like to call it one-stop shop for culture scaling. What does that mean? Um, we provide a platform that allows your employees to find events and create their own events that can teach a, um, a manager of an engineering department can host a class on Python where maybe a sales um, manager who's unhappy with her job can go and take this Python class, all the way to an engineer who really, you know, want to know how to better storytell, can take storytelling 101 from the Airbnb, you know, branding manager. Like one of the best classes you can offer. And, and the, the level of uh, engagement of the employees is, is skyrocketing. And once we implemented, um, the user adaptation just skyrocketed, just like the hockey stick. And so that's when we realized, wow, there's so much power in this peer-to-peer -peer learning as well as mentorship because um, to give you one example, one of this um, QA engineer um, in one of the companies um, came to the mentor and said, I really don't like my job. And because there was a mentorship system in place, um, she was able to speak to a, a manager who did not have that hiring or firing authority, but more of a safe place where she could experiment by sharing her concerns. And this was a sales manager where she immediately identified a lot of the qualities that this engineer had where the company spent so much money recruiting. 
And she was on the verge of being fired because she was so unhappy, disengaged, and didn't want to work. But she's an incredible um, engineer. So she actually spoke to one of the founders, and they put her in a rotation program where she became a customer success engineer and just like rock and rolled her her um, role where she got promoted as a manager to now running the entire customer success team. And that's that's one of the examples to showcase how a lot of companies are just you know really focused on the, the bottom line and the performance of that you know the the employee within that specific role, but really realizing I mean that's where a lot of the education system has failed, where you have to pick a major and you stay there and you can't really navigate. Maybe there are um, opportunity costs here and there that seem overwhelming for the young people, but um, it is really up to the companies to showcase that's okay, that's where you learn. Um, but you know, we have a different platform where we want you to go and experiment and, and learn from other people and you're not supposed to know what you don't know and that's okay. And being more nurturing, these young people would work for you, I'm not even joking, for free because they're so, they want to be heard and they want to be listened to and they just want to want to improve themselves and feel like that they can contribute back. A lot of them still like live with their parents or have so much privilege. They have this option to go around and um, not have to worry about rent. And you're asking these students to work like midnight on doing something that they don't want. That's, that's where there's so much increase of this um, disengagement and unemployment and so on. So, um, so I think on the, the matching and the skills that people need to acquire, um, you know, um, there's some brilliant work that was done by the world that's been done by the World Economic Forum on the, the, the future skills that we will all need. So we built in um, a guidance system based on the World Economic Future of Work skills to be acquired that um, matches the skills that they did acquire in, let's say, their first 20, 30 hours of work experience with that which they have not yet acquired. So it's deeply personalized um, based on the taxonomy that again has been developed not by us, but which is accepted around the world as the, the, the skills that will be required. So by observing the behaviors and the choices over time, after, if we're getting 100 hours of work experience for every young person who's using our platform, um, if there are 20 hour chunks, then at the end of the 100, they will get narrower and our recommendations get Clearer, clearer, clearer. Um, we can also summarize for the employer, the host, what skills they have already, uh, assuming that the young person gives us permission to share that with them, um, and, and what they're seeking in this. And that way, all of the advice and research that there has been, I mean, ICS is building on the shoulders of giants. There's been amazing work and the taxonomies, and there's a lot of consensus over what skills are required. It's also very clear that if you're doing this sort of work at an employer, what skills you're acquiring. So it's kind of like a gaming system. It's like, oh, we've done that. This is for the next level. This is where you need to go. And then, okay, you've done that now. For the next level, this is where you need to go. Um, and you can also do that for learning and development of employees at one of the fast growing companies. You know, you supervised two, a, a, you know, a project of two last time. Why don't you try three this time? Um, and why don't you try three, not from the, your background, but from a different background? and see how you develop with that. It's a lot, a lot that you can do, and there's a lot of understanding already on how people learn and how they develop and grow into leaders, um, which we can all build into our, our, our algorithms. We have, we have, uh, uh, we have just a little time here, but uh, when you think about all this, this learning process, about the work and then the university, we do, how, how do you believe that is the future of the university, or how is the, the best way uh, if the university have to reinvent it, to be reinvented, how, how, is the, how, how do you believe that is the learning process? And the other question that I have here is how to, to do it in the scale? Because you have a problem in Brazil, yeah? And it's challenging in Brazil. And then uh, I want you to mix these two. What, what, what do you believe that is the future of the university or the future of this learning in a scale? I, I, I think this actually goes back to um, equipping young people with hard skill versus soft skill. And a lot of that conversation comes up a lot. How do you go about training someone with soft skills? What does that even mean? Which is, um, 
it constitutes complex problem solving to negotiation, empathy, listening, um, team building, leadership, everything that is really required for all these companies to thrive and succeed. Um, and also for young people to learn on the job. A lot of them are able to do that in their universities, but universities are changing. The Gallup poll talks about how 96% of universities think that they prepare their company, uh, their, their students for future work, but only 11% of the employers think that their, their employees who are graduating from these universities are adequately equipped. And so we were looking at the gap. Why is there a gap? And it has a lot to do with the fact that universities are equipping the students with um, technical skills, hard skills, but then there's no um, platform that allows the young people to experiment and also practice that hard skill. And so that's when we came together to, to understand and analyze, to realize there needs to be a, a movement and a change that the universities are, they need to change, but also companies need to invest in these um, talents who are, who are basically receiving these talents and work together. So, so that goes back to, I love what Sherry, you're doing um, with providing more opportunities for internship opportunities, as well as um, the rotation programs that many companies now are starting to realize. And there is a movement around um, universities realizing that they have, they have that duty to, to go about um, helping their students to get more exposed and bridging that gap. So I'd love to learn more, and if you could share more about what you do with your school, that would be fantastic. Just because I have just one minute to do. I'll be very brief. Um, I think future of you, uh, braided in interconnectedness applies. We have universities understand that they're one of the stakeholders in a community. I think that's really important. Um, we've just done an analysis of how fast some of the skills gaps are emerging, and we've seen 8,000% increase in people who have data science and Hadoop skills, um, which is very clear to show that the universities are concurrently um, producing people with the right skills. So we're recommending, and this hat I've just put on as the Royal Society, which is a, it, it advises universities um, so mainly in the UK, is breeding. Um, so accepting part-time, so a data scientist at Twitter can also work three days at the university so that you're sharing this rare resource in communities um, in a really efficient way. And I think the sharing of resources is, is really important and the connecting and the use of platforms. Why create your own platform rather than using yours which interconnects the parents with the universities, with the skills, with the, with the, with the employers? I think it's really important to solve these enormous problems that we work together and recognize that each of us has a part to fill and we don't have to invent our own, we can build on some of the, some of the really good work that has been done, um, maybe not in our country, but in other people's countries so that our next generation has the same opportunities as others. Okay, thank you so much. I think just to, to resume here, that I said that we, Maybe you can create a, a, a huge ecosystem in Brazil that uh, all the universities and companies work together with the same body, the same set together, that we can continue improving since the, the schools, that the universities, and then the, the, all the systems that working force never stops learning. And I, I, just to finish, I, I'm very excited to, when I just came here for this conference, because when I saw a lot of People, a lot of leaders, a lot of legend. We have legends in Brazil. That is, uh, people that is, the Brazilians are proud of because we have that, that leaders. They are here just listening, making notes, and doing something that, I mean, they are hungry to, to do something different, hungry to, to re, really create an, uh, another country. And uh, I, I believe that if you, if you could create this ecosystem and everyone that was here, that we spread everything that we saw in this conference for the Brazilians, we can everybody work to transform our country and maybe to transform our country through education. Thank you so much to be here and thank you so much. <laughs>